Lucy, did you write that? Tell us what that's about. Isn't that amazing? Ruthie's not a public speaker yet. I think she if she can write songs like that later on. You can public speak, but um, yeah, I, I was catching that. That was very good. Thank you for that. That was a blessing. All right, we're in Luke chapter number sixteen. Um, you know, Brother Morgan's praying for a visa, and I remember when uh, Brother Bushy was here preaching, he said the number one prayer request for missionaries is visas. 
and um, so pray for them for visas. Then also be mindful that in the bank there's a big Christmas present, uh, and we are sending to the Gomez's uh, presents for them to distribute during Christmas time. It gives them an opportunity to share the gospel. And so keep your eyes peeled, keep your eyes open. I know uh, Julie had our boys go through their old toys, and uh, they gave up their action figures. Those were like, man, those were, when Timmy was little, action figures were everything. I mean, that was, so the, the creme de la creme, action figures. So he brought his action figures. And then Julie was at Walmart, the um, the very backpack that he, that she had bought for uh, Timmy. It was like seventeen ninety nine at Walmart. They're all a dollar right now. So she bought a big stack of them. Uh, so just keep your eyes peeled, and uh, it would be just a great blessing just to send a bunch of goodies uh, down there to the Gomez's, and, and uh, it'll be interesting to hear a good report back on uh, how we were a blessing to the children down there and made their Christmas, and then also um, they got to hear the gospel. So be mindful of that. Luke 16, we are going to look at the parable of the unjust steward. Uh, and so Luke 16, when you find your place there, we're going to read 13 verses, starting from verse 1 down through verse uh, 13. Uh, so let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. Luke 16, 1. And he said also unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man, which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg. I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, that they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, An hundred measures of oil. He said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. He said unto him, Take thy bill, and write fourscore. And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely for the children of Israel, uh, I'm sorry, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations." He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And let's pray together and we'll be seated. Uh, Father, we, we, we love you tonight. We thank you for being so, so good to us. We thank you for just the richness of your blessings each and every day. And Lord, we thank you for the fellowship that we have to you and that is available to, to us uh, because we're your children. We are born again into the family of God. We thank you that we do have a seat at the table waiting for us in heaven. And Lord, we do long to be home. Uh, but Lord, I pray that you'd help us in the meantime here in our pilgrimage. I pray that you would help us tonight uh, just to see ourselves in scripture. I pray that our uh, we would have a hungry appetite for your word, that we would um, consume scripture tonight and we'd feed our souls. I pray that our hearts would be tender. Lord, I pray that you would help us uh, just look at this parable uh, in freshness as 2,000 years ago when you spoke it for the first time. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts directly tonight. And we pray this for your sake and for your glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
Uh, so here's a parable of the, the unjust steward. So here is an example of somebody bad who had good qualities. You ever notice that? You know, I read a lot of biographies, and there's a lot of bad people out there who had some good qualities about them. Uh, so this is one of these characters. Overall, he wasn't that good, but he did have one good quality about him, and the Lord wanted us to emulate that good quality. He wanted us to learn it and emulate it. Uh, so he was a steward. Stewardship, of course, is managing the affairs of another. Uh, so you are entrusted not with your own riches, but the riches of another. Everything you've given, been given here in this uh, lifetime is another's. It is not your own, uh, even your own life. Ye are not your own. You are purchased with a price. Therefore, for glorify God in your bodies, which are Christ. Even my own body is not mine. It is my own. So I just have stewardship over it. Uh, and even my children, they're the heritage of the Lord. They're not my heritage. Uh, and so I, I am temporarily loaned my master's goods. And then, uh, so Gabe and I, you know, Gabe's saying my church. That's a good feeling to say my church. Um, and, but we know that it ain't my church. It ain't, you know, his, his church ain't his church. My church ain't my church. Uh, it's God's church. It's the Amen. Lord's church. And you're not my sheep. <laughs> you're Christ's sheep. Uh, but there is a stewardship that has been given to me. I am an under-shepherd, underneath the shepherd. Uh, and he says, I want you to feed my sheep, my sheep. He said, I want you to feed your sheep. He said, I want you to feed my sheep. Uh, and so I have a temporary uh, time frame, uh, you know, and, and just a temporary moment in time. And everything is transitioning. Everything is changing. I hate change. And I, I'm sure that you, a lot of you uh, don't like change as well. Uh, but everything is changing. We're in, we're in a constant flux here on this, on this earth, and everything that's been given to us is not ours permanently. But someday you will have a permanent dwelling, and someday you will be entrusted in an eternal station. Uh, but right now it's just your stewardship. You're managing the affairs of another, uh, and, and they, nothing here on this earth is ultimately yours. Nothing is yours. So... Uh, we know this verse, that the one thing that's required of you, anybody can do it. Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man, woman, should be found what? Faithful. Faithful. That's all God requires. That's all God expects of you uh, for what he has entrusted you with, time, talent, treasure, uh -huh. uh, for this temporary time. He just wants you to do one thing. He wants you to be faithful in what you have been given. Uh, so we see an unfaithful steward. He has not been faithful. In fact, he is wasteful with the master's goods. Uh, he's, he's wasting time. He's not uh, living up to uh, Ephesians chapter number 5. He's not redeeming the time because the days are evil. He's not buying back the time. Uh, instead, he's just enjoying the luxury of his master. Uh, he is feathering his own nest with his master's goodies and making his life comfortable. And he's a waster. Remember what prodigal means? Prodigal means wasteful. Uh, so here is a wasteful, a prodigal uh, steward. Verse number one. And he came to his disciples. There was a certain rich man. And he said to his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward. And the same was accused unto him that he wasted his, the master's, goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no longer steward. Uh, and so here's the first thing we see here is the master's rebuke. The accusation was that you are wasteful. You have uh, three things essentially that you are going to give ultimately an account for. Number one is your time, uh, redeeming the time because the days are evil, Ephesians 5.16. Uh, and then he says, in verse number 17, Paul says, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So you better understand what the will of the Lord is if you're not going to waste your time, and then you better invest your time in the way that God wants you to invest your time. Uh, then we also have our talent. First Peter 4.10 says, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We've all received a gift, uh, and you are God's gift to His body, your body, a bride, a flock, uh, and the Holy Spirit has gifted you with certain gifts, and uh, you unwrap those gifts as you minister to the assembly of the saints. 
And so you're given talent. Uh, and then another thing that you're entrusted with is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, Paul writes to Timothy, his preacher boy, and again and again and again, he says, Oh, Timothy, keep which, that which is committed to thy trust. Uh, a trust is a fund where you make a deposit. Now, Paul had uh, committed his time uh, and energy into young Timothy, uh, and then Timothy had seen things with his eyes uh, uh, as he traveled with the Apostle Paul, and this was given unto him special things, and God had given unto him uh, this ministry, not just to sit on it, uh, but to use it, and he says, Timothy, keep the faith. Keep that which is committed unto thy trust. So we're given the gospel. First Thessalonians 2, 4 says, But as we are allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. We're put in trust with the gospel. If you're saved, God has uh, committed to your trust the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of salvation and he has entrusted that to you. Your master has given to you for a temporary moment in time the blessed gospel, uh, the, the hope of everlasting life that we find in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been entrusted to you. And then also the Lord, of course, uh, has given us our treasure. Where he commanded us, lay not up for yourselves uh, treasures on earth where moss and rust doth corrupt, but lay for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. So there's an accusation. You're wasteful of that which you have been given. A report has come back. You have been wasteful. And then he says, there's an accusation. Here's the accounting. Verse number two. And he called unto him and said unto him, How is it that I hear of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship that thou mayest no longer steward. God is calling his goods and his investment into reckoning, and he's calling it into account. Romans 14, 10 through 12 says this, But why dost thou, char why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. And so every one of us shall give an account of himself unto God. Matthew twenty five twenty one. As the Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. This is a servant, a steward standing before God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. The word appear there means to make transparent. Nothing will be hidden from the eyes of God. Everything will be uh, revealed. And even the Bible says every idle word which is spoken will be called into an account. And will all make an appearance. That is a legal term. Uh, and I've used this, I've told this joke before, but I like it, so I'll tell it again. You know, uh, charismatic tent meeting, healing preacher up there, and uh, Bubba comes forward, and the, the evangelist uh, says, Bubba, how can I pray for you? And he says, pray for my hearing. And so, you know, he lays his hands on Bubba's ears and prays over him and shakes him a little bit and says, now, Bubba, how's your hearing now? And Bubba says, well, my hearing ain't till next Tuesday. <laughs> Uh, and Bubba's here is next Tuesday, but you know that you and I have an appearing before God. We will be called into the throne room of the Lord Jesus Christ, and everything that we have been given will be called into an account and made record of. Uh, the great statesman Noah Webster was one time asked, uh, and here's, here's the great mind, uh, and he's asked one time, what was the greatest, most profound thought to ever enter your mind? And he said this, the sense of my individual responsibility to God. The sense of my individual responsibility to 
God. So the very fact that we're called into account someday ought to have a bearing and be, uh, have an overarching uh, bearing on everything that we say or will ever do. I want you to notice the steward's response. So he's rebuked by his master, and here is, here is the steward's re response. Here's this unjust man. Verse number three, Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. <laughs> he said, I don't want to get a blue-collar job. I cannot dig. And to beg, I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their Houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto him first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, In a hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, sit down, and write fifty. Uh, he said, I'm going to give you a fifty percent discount on your loan, uh, and, and here's, here's who you're going to owe. You're going to owe me, okay? Because uh, I'm going to need a place to live. I'm about ready to get put on my stewardship. Uh, and so give me a bill for fifty percent, and I will write you a note that your debt is settled. And then he goes to the next man. And so the next man, and the implication is here, the next person, the next person, the next person, uh, is he, he starts uh, with, with his, his master's uh, debt and master's money, he starts making bargains. And so, and so verse 5, he, so he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, how much owest thou my Lord? Verse 7, then he said unto another, and how much owest thou? And he said unto him, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take that bill, write four score. So he gave that guy a 20% discount, and on and on and on. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. So the steward's response was he realized his dilemma that he was going to give an account, and then he made a decision. Uh, and the old saying is, is that the, that necessity is the mother of invention. And so he had a short amount of time to do something about a big, big, big problem in his life. Uh, and let me tell you something, any, any problem in your life, uh, it can be dealt with, it can be ha handled on short order if you need to do that. So if I said, how many are depressed this evening? How many are feeling down, you feeling depressed? Uh, you know what? I could solve that that fast. I could just go to you. I could pull out a gun, cock the hammer back, hold it to your head, and say, you feel happy or I'm going to pull this trigger. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I guarantee you would do this. Uh, I can be happy. You know, it was a nice fall day today, and I do like puppies and you know, the, uh, the dinner was uh, really, uh, you know, uh, good tonight before I came to church. And I, I guess I don't have it, so I'm not depressed anymore. I mean, look at that. I mean, 20 seconds and I solved your depression, right? All of a sudden, you made a decision, a conscious decision. You were going to do something about the imminency of the situation. Uh, and so let me tell you something about your life that no man or woman knows the day or the hour that they will be called into account. Uh, but anywhere in Scripture where it talks about your life, we know that the appearance of the Lord is imminent and we are to treat it as if we could appear at any moment before the Lord Jesus Christ. Understand this, you know, all eschatology has to do ultimately with this, is that I am going to stand before Christ. I better get ready to stand before Christ. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. And if I'm looking to stand before Jesus Christ, I, it's going to directly affect my behavior right at this very moment. Uh, so he says the children of this world are wiser uh, in their generation than the kingdom of men. And I could, you know, we could embellish this. I could talk about all sorts of success stories uh, of self-made billionaires and things who just were wise concerning money and successful in the things of this world. And the Lord's looked at these type of men, these type of women who what we would call are hustlers and hard workers and very, very shrewd. And he says, ultimately, why can't you be like that concerning eternal things? Here's the Lord's recommendation to his disciples. Number one is this, be wise. Verse number eight. So the Lord commended the unjust steward. So he complimented him. And he says, because he had done wisely. 
For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. It says in Daniel 12, 3, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Uh, what wisdom is, is knowledge applied. If I said, how many, how many know that you are saved tonight? How many know that you are saved? So yes, I know that I'm saved. Why do you know that you're saved? Why don't you say, well, because there was a time and place where I realized I was a sinner, and I realized that if I got what I deserve, I will go to hell, and I realized that Jesus Christ died for my sins on the cross. Heaven was a free gift, and I called upon the Lord Jesus Christ and received that free gift. You know what that is? Amen. That is knowledge that you have in your mind, but that is not wisdom. Uh, you know what wisdom is? Is wisdom when you take that knowledge and you go and you give that to somebody else, and then the Bible calls you wise. Uh, did you know that unless you not only uh, receive the gospel but also exercise the gospel, that you will not have the wisdom of God in your life? You will not know the ways of God unless you are obedient to the Great Commission. Let me explain this. Explain it this way. And they that be wise. Uh, do you know that people who are out after souls are prayer warriors? I've never met a soul owner who wasn't also a prayer warrior. I've never, I've hardly ever heard a prayer, a testimony by somebody who got the witness to somebody else that didn't immediately follow up their testimony with a prayer request. Would you please pray for this person to be saved? Pray for me the next time that I talk to them, uh, that I will have the right words to say, or I got to lead this person to Christ. Would you now pray for them that they would grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Uh, you know what you're wise in if you are like this uh, unjust steward and going out there and trying, to, uh, and trying to expand the kingdom of heaven to the best of your ability? You're going to have wisdom. I mean, this works for all areas of your life. You're going to, you're going to be wise. And so God said, I would have you to be wise. And then another thing, it says, and I'd have you to be a friend. And it says, I say to you, make to yourself friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Now, um, let me tell you something about the dollar. It's going to fail. Yes, sir. You're right. I'm not going to tell you what's going to happen with the debt. I have no idea. I remember back when the debt, this is how old I am. I remember back when the debt was $6 trillion, And I remember Bill Clinton saying, it's biting his lip, saying, that is unconscionable that we are $6 trillion in debt. It used to be that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Democrats were going to spend money and, and um, they, they were going to spend, they were going to have deficit spending, uh, and you kind of knew it. And then the Republicans said, we are going to be conservative. And then they had deficit spending. And now one thing that Democrats and Republicans both have <laughs> in common is that they're both going to uh, spend themselves into debt. Uh, so the American dollar is going to fail. But let me tell you something, I don't know what's going to happen. But ultimately, do you know that money is going to fail you? Yeah. And here's how it's going to fail. All your possessions are going to fail you. You have a good doctor, your doctor's going to fail you. Uh, I mean, you have a good job, your job's going to fail. You know why it's going to fail? Is because you, my friend, are going to die. Your stewardship is going to be called into account. And you might have tens of millions of dollars in the bank, and it's going to do you absolutely no good, and it is going to fail. And so the Lord says, here's what you need to do, okay? You can have temporary friends, but what you need is everlasting friends to invite you into eternal habitations. Look at verse number 9. And I say unto you, make you friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. So here's exactly what the Lord's saying. 
Uh, and, you know, we haven't been to heaven yet, and I don't know exactly how the economy of heaven works, uh, but I do know that there's going to be fellowship up there in heaven. And so the Lord is saying here, if you go out there and you are a steward of the gospel, that you are going to make yourself everlasting friends. There's a special bond uh, that you have with the person who brought you to Jesus Christ that doesn't only last in just this lifetime, it also lasts through eternity. And so as I'm investing my time, talent, and treasure, and as I'm given to missions, and as I'm giving out tracts, and there is, going to be, uh, there is going to be people out there that are going to everlastingly be my friends, be a gospel friend. Remember that the Lord Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. Remember that he was a friend of publicans and sinners. And here's the last thing. Verse 10, and he said, be faithful. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is also unjust in much. So remember, Scripture tells us uh, what, that uh, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So here's your two greatest abilities, okay? Availability and dependability. And he says, if you're faithful in little, I'll make you ruler over much. When we went to uh, Black River and, and um, you know, it's used to preaching to more people and it used to having a big ministry and starting around with one year-round member. And uh, I remember our, our midweek service a lot of times, uh, very, very low in population. A lot of times soldiers had to work late too, didn't make it to the midweek service. Uh, but I did for my own uh, my own well-being, my own encouragement in the Lord every single Wednesday night. Uh, right at the close, we'd stand. I mean, this happened from about the year into the ministry there all the way to the time that I left. Uh, we'd stand and sing, Little is much when God is in it, labor not for... And you know, it was I was preaching and singing to myself because I was saying it didn't matter if you're preaching to 100 people on Wednesday night, Jack, or one person on Wednesday night that you need to be faithful in little... Uh, and that is all I am expecting of you. Uh, and that one person is just as important as the maximum and as the whole. Uh, there's going to be times in your life where you feel like you have little effect. You know, um, you know like for instance, Brother Gabe, man, I'm really excited right now. It's kind of on that momentum, on that juju. You know, here, let's see what's, you know, I know in about a year from now, you're looking out and thinking, man, am I really even making a difference? telling you I already gave this what you're going to think and it's like I don't know how much effect that I've had you know uh, and God is not worried about uh, effect or the bottom line or anything else he's looking for fidelity in that little thing in which you have and God said there is no little stewardship because little stewardship ends up with much if you are Faithful. So there's supposed to be a fidelity that we have. And I want you to notice the fidelity uh, is supposed to be with mammon. And mammon is just things. Verse number 11, it says, If therefore ye have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust true riches? Uh, let me tell you something. Everything here in this life is tainted. Everything here in this life is temporary. And you are entrusted with tainted temporary, non-eternal things. So you have a window of opportunity in this life to use this temporary life that is tainted uh, and this little stewardship that we have. Uh, it, it's no riches at all because you're not keeping it. You're an eternal soul. You don't have it for eternity. Uh, and, and he says, if you're not faithful in this temporary, unrighteous mammon, uh, you're not going to be placed in stewardship with eternal riches. Uh, let me tell you something about your stewardship is you're getting ready for a larger stewardship, okay? Uh, and so you are actually not getting, you know, God is preparing you for the kingdom to come and for you to live in the kingdom to come. And God is going to use you in capacity for his kingdom. When his kingdom comes, he's going to use you in direct proportion to how you used your temporary unrighteous mammon here upon this earth. And so he says, If therefore ye have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, Christ 
gods, uh, the, the master of all, all your possessions, who shall give you that which is your own? That's everlasting riches in heaven. And then verse number 13. Uh, no servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Warren Wiersbe says this, If God is our master, then money will be our servant. We will use our resources in the will of God. But if God is not our master, then we will become the servants of money, and money is a terrible master. We'll waste our life and not invest our life. Another person said this, Money is a great servant, but a terrible master. I think of Revelation 3, 18. It talks about eternal riches. I trade in temporary riches that mean absolutely nothing for eternal riches. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest be rich. <laughs> you know, this is literal, folks. I mean, we, t we want to spiritualize it, and we can spiritualize it that, uh, man, uh, the little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. I, and I believe that is totally true. I, and I think that you and I are more happy. We're blessed. We have the Word of God. We have the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's multi-billionaires who are absolutely miserable tonight, and uh, they're worried about their wealth. That we live on a higher plane. So we could say, absolutely, we are rich, okay? Uh, but when it talks about riches, remember that we're going where the streets are paved with gold, uh, and that we do have treasure that we do lay up in heaven. So he says, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white, and, and, uh, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness did not appear. And anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. So one thing that I would, I would uh, highlight here in the parable, the unjust steward. Again, he was not a good guy, but he had one good quality, and that was he was innovative concerning the dilemma that he is in. Let me tell you something tonight that you're in a dilemma. Your time is running out, okay? Uh, the, you, in short order, like the unjust steward, you're going to stand before God and give an account. How many are excited about that? Amen, amen. I'm not. <laughs> Okay, uh, but I better keep this before my eyes and try to live in accordance with the reality uh, that I am going to give an account. Innovative, innovative. If I held a gun to your head tonight and said, you need to get the gospel out in the next 24 hours, I'm going to pull this trigger. I guarantee you that you could do it. And you could think of 100 different ways and fashions in which to do it. Uh, one thing that I believe that God challenged us individually and then also corporately as a church is that we would be innovated in our outreach. New move-in lists. Remember this morning? Eating cake and putting stamps and things on there. Halloween tricks. And all the smudges on the back of those ink smudges. <laughs> Trunk or treat. I think, what are the time of year... Do people, you know, especially with the, if you're a door knocker, um, it's like a dream come true. People come into your house. You don't have to go to their house. They're coming to your door uh, and wanting something. And I, I mean, I remember up in, in Black River uh, where the church was, it was a village, and then it was like the nice um, sidewalks there. And so the rural country people, they'd all come into the village. And I mean, there'd be cars parked all up and down. It's a little bit of different dynamics when there's, there's so much more of this out here in Webster. Uh, but people, we, we able, we're able to, we'd have hot cider and we'd have cookies and then we'd give out tracks and candy to the kids. And it was like a dream come true. Everybody's coming to our church door uh, and we get an opportunity to share the gospel with them. Uh, right then and there. Uh, and I remember there's people in the church living in these different villages, and some will be able to give out 150, 180 tracks in one night. Uh, you know what that is? That is innovation. 180 people get to hear the gospel on a night where kids are coming by to your door, and you get to stick a track in their basket. Amen. And uh, I remember one time somebody told me in the church that, yes, yeah, somebody came back and gave me my track back. I said, you tell them to give your candy back? So now I said, I want my candy back too. Bring my track back. Uh, innovative. Uh, 
trunk or treat. You know, we, we're going to, on, uh, on October 31st, between 5 and 7, there'll be people around in here. We'll have uh, this part of the parking lot. They have a big banner out there. It's going to be advertised for a week or so. People, and we will wear masks for Halloween. We'll cover this part of our face. And we'll have on gloves. It is a very, to me, it's a very scary costume. I think one of the more scarier ones. <laughs> Especially since it's government mandated. It's like the Nation of Islam or something, all these people covering their face. And, uh, and so we'll be out there in this parking lot. I thought that last one was just that last comment. But uh, we're out there, and uh, we're, we're, we're given uh, innovative. Uh, there's jails. There's public school uh, Bible clubs. You know, in the state of New York, they, they allow you to have a Bible club in a public school. And I don't know during COVID how that works, uh, but I know very many people that have done that. Uh, you know that uh, there's all sorts of opportunities and chances for community events and outreach centers and uh, giveaways. We think of the Red, White, and Blue Sunday where we get to honor first responders. And, uh, and Dan Woodward came up with the idea. He said, why don't we take all the rest of those? We had about 37 bags left and go down to the Webster PD and, um, and give out those bags. Now, they, I, I talked to Chief Rieger. He had 33 different officers working, then some clerical workers and things, uh, and took in all 37 of those bags. And, I mean, besides having a $10 Dunkin' Donut gift card, which I think is very, uh, very nice, uh, you know, they got the pins in there and other things, and then they have a Dunn book, I mean, an 80-page gospel track and track in there, and uh, there's innovation that needs to be done. Remember that little is much when God is in it. We were at the Church Planners Conference yesterday. Uh, there's a fellow there by the name of Tim Denning. Our old piano, we gave to Tim Denning because he is a church planner in Albion, New York. Uh, and Tim Denning told me yesterday, he said, tell Steve Bradley I said hi. Now, Steve Bradley, he sits about right over there on Sunday morning. Heavy set fella. Uh, sits right over there. He worked in the post office with Tim Denning for decades and witnessed to Tim, witnessed to Tim, witnessed to Tim. And when I announced that we were going to give our piano to a church planner, Tim Denning, he said, you know, I used to work with a guy named Tim Denning. He wasn't, he wasn't saved. I said, well, let me ask him if he knows. Well, sure enough. And Tim said yesterday, he said, Steve Bradley was instrumental in me coming to Christ. He went to a guy, and he didn't even know. Steve didn't even know that Tim Denning ever even got saved. Let me tell you something. You keep on, you know, um, if, if, you, if you keep on sowing and keep on sowing and faint not, the Bible says that you are going to enjoy the harvest. And let me tell you something. Is that in this life, you only see a little fraction of your fruit. You, you don't, you don't, you come, when you come rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with you, that's then. You only see a little bit now. Uh, and so he says, if you're faithful in little, God will make you ruler over much. Uh, I got to interview Mark Bushy, and it's interesting just seeing his life and his ministry, and, uh, you know, knew him as a teenager. I was, um, I think I'm, uh, 10 years younger than him, something like this. And I remember when he went out to New Zealand and did such a great work and people were boasting about his work there in New Zealand. He said, and he says this on the interview, if you want to listen to it, it's somewhere on one of our channels or something. Uh, but he said, um, he said, I sat down with another missionary couple and they told me, he said, listen, uh, soul winning doesn't work over here. And if you're here for 30 years, you, you can count yourself as a success if you have 30 people after 30 years. And he said, I, le I left that meeting really, really upset. And he said, if I'm going to do anything, I'm going to prove those people wrong. And, and so when he left his church over there, they were running over 300, the biggest independent Baptist church in all of New Zealand. And he said it was just born out of just door-to-door sowing, winning people to Christ, and doing the work. Listen to a podcast this week. Uh, by two boys about their preacher father, Tim and Mark Rasmussen. Mount, uh, Mark Rasmussen, he, he, um, he is a earned doctorate. He, he taught at uh, Hiles Anderson, then he taught at Crown College, and now he's out at West Coast Baptist College. His brother, Tim, uh, pastors the Longview Baptist Church in Longview, California. But they're interviewed about their father. And I've heard... I've heard 
Mark Rasmussen, he's telling me personally, he said, my father was the best sow owner I ever knew. And you know, one thing about good, good sow owners that I've noticed, another good sow owner that we've had here preach, and he's preaching a, a, a friend day. Pray that COVID goes away by friend day in April. But uh, we'll have a big friend day, and we'll have our Bialette. And we remember the last time, we had a great time. We had eight, eight people come forward, and we, we packed the place out. But our Bialette is one of, the, one of the great soul owners in the United States of America. When he was there at First Baptist of Bridgeport, he had one person down the aisle every single Sunday that he had personally led to Christ. And, and then also Rick Flanders, who is evangelist, he is, he's out of our Bialette's church. And I said, Ben, I would love to go soul owning with our Bialette. And he says, you know what his secret is? I mean, he's a talented man, a very smart man, a capable man. He says, you know what you know, you know, know what his secret is? He just does it. I mean, everywhere he goes, he talks to people about Christ. And if you spend any time, you go in a restaurant or whatever, he's going to talk to everybody just about their soul and has a masterful way of doing it. It's amazing how if you do something thousands and thousands of times and 10,000 hour rule, you become a master of your craft. Uh, and so Mark and Tim Rasmus, and, and again, I've, I've heard Mark Rasmus talk about his dad. Uh, they were telling, here's two boys just testifying about their father, and they, both these boys are in the ministry today. Uh, and they said, you know, Dad, uh, between 3 and 6, he'd leave the church office. Here's what happened. He picked a small church when he was a young man. There in Longview, there was a bunch of houses going up, and he said, there's going to be a bunch of young families that I will be able to reach and he had an opportunity to take a bigger church, but he took this church because he knew that there was potential with these younger families moving into the area. Uh, and he said, he said, Dad would leave the office between 3 and 6 uh, every day, and uh, supper was at 6, so he'd try to be home by supper time, but between 3 and 6 he would go soul winning. Uh, and he said it, sometimes the dinner, he would be late for dinner, and Mom would wait 20 minutes to 6.20. Boys, both boys talking. And he said... At 6.20, they'd stick, the, they'd stick Dad's dinner, wrap it in foil, stick it in the oven, and then they'd go ahead and eat because Dad was, must have been talking to somebody. He said, Dad, would come home and eat, and then he said they, that he would go back out to 9 o'clock at night. And he said, except for Friday night, that was family night, and they spent family. Then he said, Saturday, he was out there uh, all day, and he said, then he said when he would come home, he had his sweetheart book, okay? That's what they call out at West Coast. That's what they call their, your list of names. Everybody in that church has a list of names of people they're praying for and <laughs> reaching out. And just one. So he'd take out his sweetheart book. And he said, remember, how many are this old that you remember when the phone was attached to the walls? Yeah. That's how old I am, man. I am old. It's dirt. Okay? I remember, <laughs> I remember when my mom was sitting in the kitchen, you know, you would have to step over or duck underneath the Remember those days? Um, so he said that Dad would pull his chair up to the phone and sit there and call down his list for the next day. And he says and when Dad went to give the church over, the church was switching over to Tim. Tim is now the pastor. Um, he said that he had over 400 people in that church that he had personally led to Christ. You know what the boys said? They said this. Soul winning still works, but it is work. You know, we want results from doing nothing. We want to offer to God that which costs us nothing. You know, I've heard evangelist Dennis Corll uh, say this. He says, you know, they say soul winning doesn't work anymore. And he says, it doesn't work any less either. <laughs> you know, I don't care how technologi technologically advanced we become, you will never, ever replace face-to-face -face contact. And here's, a, here's an unjust wise steward, and he's wise in the fact that he's going to go to everyone that he knows and everyone who is indebted to his master, and he is going to reconcile with them. He's going to go to the next one. 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 And the Lord says, you need to be wise. He says, you need to make friends. What a day heaven's going to be when someone you led to Christ said, like, I'm cooking you dinner tonight. You come over to my place and you can stay as long as we want because we got eternity, right? That's a long time. And, and it's going to be a day when you make friends and you say, thank God that I was faithful in little. Maybe I have little time, talent, treasure, and ability, 
But that little that God get, had given me to do, I was faithful in that. Let's stop there. Lord, we love you. We thank you just for the challenge that God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, gave to his disciples the same challenge that we're given tonight. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be wise stewards. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching the sermon today. We'd like to express our thanks to you by sending you this book right here. It's called Done. What most religions do not teach you about the Word of God. It's about how you can have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you would email us at mylbbc at gmail.com, we'll be sure to get that out to you. Also, if you'd like to find out more information about us, uh, here in the ministry of the Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church, you can find us on the web at lbbc.info. Uh, there at the website, you can find out about our ministries. If you'd like to give to this ministry, you can do so there. If you'd like to reach out to us by mail, you can find us at 48 South Estate Drive, Webster, New York, 14580. God bless you. Make sure that you like this video, subscribe, and share. If you do that, we'd appreciate that. God bless. Thank you.